Well, why don't you get your favorite hanging on there? How about this one? You like this one? Oh, yeah, that one's pretty. That's pretty right there. Now, hang that on the tree. Okay. Mm-hmm. I like the blue balls. Season 7.5. Blue balls. 7.5. Enlighten yourself with blue balls. 7.5. NYCFC. Like the knobs on the level meters that we are blowing out on your listening device of choice. Ladies and gentlemen, you've got blue balls after the shortest and longest break uh, that we can imagine taking after a championship season. Holy shit, already we're back, and we are so glad to see you. My name is Jake Beckhardt, and I'm your intrepid co-host, and I'm joined by my intrepid co-host, Mr. Trey Fillmore. Trey, how are you this week? I feel... Good. It's good to be back. It feels weird, as you said. It felt like forever, and also feels like it's crazy. Yesterday. It feels so. I feel so out of practice. It's fucking nuts. Yeah. But also, it was exactly <laughs> like five days ago. <laughs> this is the shortest off season in in club history, quite literally. True, and we kind of had to delay our preseason because nothing really happened. Yeah, we just immediately got to the important games. There was no televised preseason. There was no big, huge transfers to talk about. It was just kind of nope. And for whatever reason, very little press access or like, oh yeah, <laughs> like um, conversation with the uh, with the fo entirely. And now, hey, we're back. Almost instantaneous. Oops, soccer's back. Here we go. Um, for those who care or were worried, my foot is now feeling better. Uh, the last <laughs> you left me, I was, uh, I was in poor shape. But now I just have a sick scar. Potentially mauled. Yeah. Oh, yeah? I haven't seen, I haven't seen it yet. Does it look cool? Not really. It's kind of going away. Um. You gonna draw a face on it? Maybe tattoo something around it? Like, um, like that game that you play where, like, you draw a line and then somebody has to make something out of it? Hmm. Sure. <laughs> I don't know that game. Um, yeah. No, so it's feeling you know, good. You know. We're good. I'm ready to be back. Yeah, honestly, me too. I'm really ready to be back. I'm looking forward to it quite a lot. I've been watching a lot of the Winter Olympics. Have you been no. following? Not at no? all. No? Nobody <laughs> Literally is. Literally not. But not in our household, all. whenever the Olympics are on, we leave the television on like 24 hours a day. It's like a having a fish tank for like four weeks uh, in in whatever, like every two years. Sure. Every year in this case. Yeah. But it's weird this year because like <laughs> all the coverage is like this is the most uh, like honored uh, bobsled team in the world for five years running. The human rights abuses in China uh, should, must be taken into account even as we celebrate the athletic prowess of the um, of, of the Olympians on display today. And it's a very strange tonal balance that they are, I would say, failing to strike in the coverage. Oh, just wait they till the, be, there's, the World Cup's going to be a fucking nightmare. Oh my God, for real though. I can't believe the World Cup is this year. Can you believe that? Yeah, and it should be sooner. But because we have to play in fucking... Qatar, Qatar. It has to be a fucking Qatar in uh, Thanksgiving in World Cup. Yeah, November. Oh my god. Yeah, I know. Bizarre, right? It's a strange. Listen, it's a, it's this brave new world we're living in. Um, watch the Olympics. Why the fuck not? You know, get get it on a Peacock account. Just hang out. It's a good time. And what's her name? Who doped in in Russia? She didn't win the thing, so everything's okay now. <laughs> feel so bad for that but like, why did i bring it up because i've been sitting here like watching like leaving sports on that i only like tangentially care about and this morning i was watching sweden and slovakia play hockey and i was like you know i really fucking wish i had some soccer to watch and god bless it starting this week i do i mean you know there's premier league but like who wants to watch shit tier leagues like that i want my mls back and i'm getting it very soon and my championship winning nycfc who did, in fact, play a match this week. But we'll get to that. We're coming to it. First, let's talk about some of these off-season moves. I mean, we ha- went in with basically no idea what was going to happen, but a lot of predictions. Some of them came true, some of them less so. Even a couple surprises. Let's run through them. What moves happened and what moves didn't. I feel like the first and easiest thing to talk about is that Tati Castellanos, inside of 10 minutes, 
opened his account with NYCFC this season and is, as far as we can tell, not going anywhere until the summer. Fair to say, Trey? Absolutely. And it's only fitting to start a first podcast of the year with this wild situation going on in the first five minutes of this podcast. <laughs> and it's shocking. I don't know. I, what were the chances he wasn't going to move? Uh, it's hard to say because we don't know the internal workings, et cetera, et cetera. But it is not normal for this team to have players subtweeting them and then having to stay on the team. It's it, 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 That's what was perhaps the most shocking is that it's a, it's a rare situation that we're not used to in the last year, a championship winning year, where players and coaches and front offices are not on the same page. And it was a very odd way of... of um, you know, uh, this whole situation. I don't know. It's I, I'm shocked. At personally. least publicly, right? Like it's it's. We've heard stories, especially in like the last year or and change of um, of those dissonances or of those disagreements, like happening behind closed doors. But here, I think. I mean, it's just so obvious that Tati really wanted to be at his like next level gig by now, and because they know they have a high-value asset on their hands, both in terms of play and also in terms of what they can get for him, um, that simply didn't happen, which, of course, you're going to be pissed, but it's really not in your control. Maybe people don't understand this, but, like, Tati's not the only person in charge of Tati's fate, and now that the, like, offers are rolling in, maybe from Leeds, I mean, you know, who knows what the fuck is good, uh... Like there's it there's only further evidence to suggest that the the things the offers that NYCFC was getting for Tati did not match where his ceiling is in terms of what they can make off of his his fucking meteoric rise. And in the meantime, we can get a few mat like a few months of really good play out of him. It seems like he's not phoning it in. The Concacaf Champions match showed us that. Yeah, I think that's the most important. I mean, the best case scenario right now is the fact that Tati is not a kind of person who, to mope. Th- this situation could have gone to one of two ways. There's, you know, obviously he thought he was going to be sold. He wasn't sold. He was upset about it. All that is obvious and clear. He could mope, play poorly, uh, be pissed, tweet some more whatever or what looked what it looked like and from all accounts heard in the preseason matches um that they played and as well as in the game that we did see he's playing angry and he's playing hungry and he's like fuck you i'll prove myself and it's it's almost like my cfc is like no oh no you're mad at us and playing really well because of it don't be mad wink wink uh, uh, like it's it, it only works out for the better for the team if that's what's going to happen. Um, it, it it there are some ramifications. I think it's my my, my I, I I texted you about this when he sent out that tweet. Essentially, like Tati early in January did the eyes emoji, time emoji, sand sand gla- what's it called hourglass emoji. Uh, you got there, which is like a trope that basketball players and soccer players have used to be like "Ooh, a move is happening and then like how embarrassing is it for him that it that nothing happened and then he goes oh once upon a time when promises were kept in football very emotine of him he is still 23 so it makes sense um I, I, and it's almost like I, I there was a moment where i was like is it worth like holding out for another two million dollars if you're gonna have a disgruntled player but obviously the front office took that bet they said yes it's worth it because we believe he'll play well and we believe we'll get more money and as of now it's still obviously still have to wait to see if it was a good idea a good move whatever um because locker room cohesiveness and everything and trust built among the players is one of the most important things that is not seen on the pitch right um so we'll see if it works out. It's just really shocking that nothing happened, I think. But by the same dint, it's he also can't afford not to play well, you know? Like, let's mm-hmm, let's not mm-hmm. treat Tati like he's a toddler. Like, he knows what the fuck is good, too. They have him a little bit over a barrel, but he's in a, he's he's still... He's demonstrated his values, demonstrated his worth, but he's still an unknown quantity for a lot of these clubs that are putting in offers for him. And, uh... And, 
let it like if he lets this thing become like a temperamental um, check on his ability to play soccer, that's that weakens his position as well. It not to mention also, I think that one of the things, excuse me, the most to Tati's credit is that he's not. Uh, he knows he's a star, but he has never felt like bigger than the side. He's dead, like be, like bigger than the squad. Uh, you can tell in the locker room, you can tell on the field, that he's a person who is in touch with the rest of the team and I think would struggle if he felt he that his like behavior or his situation or like his attitude was letting... He's not a person who like sacrifices the team's well-being for his own attitude. I don't think we've ever seen that from him, and it doesn't surprise me at all that he's not about to let down you know, players that he won a league championship with uh, because he's because of a like a a petulance about um, about being about feeling misled or like promises were broken. A hundred percent, and he has to play well if he wants to go to a good club. You know, before it was he was on the radar, and clubs might yeah, be that's watching his tape or watching what you know highlights or whatever. But now that there's been a transfer window where he was available and teams were looking at him. Now they're going to be paying attention to his games. He knows that. Uh, So he's going to try to play well every week. Uh, The other thing is that uh, this is the gamble that was not discussed or even thought about or mentioned. Clearly, Tati and his team did not think about this. When you sign this extension halfway through last year so you can double your pay, um, this is one of the outcomes that could happen. (laughs) You're you're not the arbiter of your own fate if you're a player um, at the end of the day, uh, excluding new Brooklyn Nets player Ben Simmons, which would be the total opposite way they could have gone. If Dante goes, oh, I'm not playing. Fuck you. I'll pay the fines. But (laughs) in soccer, especially in MLS, there's no one who can have that amount of power. So this is the only way it could have gone if the team didn't want to sell him. And we'll see if it's turned out to be the right decision, you know? We certainly will. Um, I'm sure it's a thing that they, like, I'm sure it's a thing that they accounted for. It's just that, like, the upside of it, ultimately, it's, it's just a little bit more pain. Right? It's a little bit more discomfort. But the reason that things are happening or look to be happening as smoothly as they are right now, I think, is in fact because everybody knew that this was a possible outcome, even if it's not the ideal one. Um, Something that Kevin... So, uh, sorry to interrupt. Um, this just You fuck. <laughs> sorry, we're not in person right now. Hard to read the cues. Uh, sorry to break the illusion. Uh, if... if we are in person right now. We are on top of a mountain. We're in a, like a an abbey. The acoustics are fantastic. I'm, let's use the theater of the mind to bring you here with us to the Himalayas where we're broadcasting from. What, what did Kevin say? What the fuck are you talking about? In the pr- season preview he, he wrote for American Soccer Analysis, you should check out. Everybody read it. Everybody read it. If Tati's a player who started 32 of 34 games last year, and... We're going to depend on him. Uh, I assume a similar amount the first half of this season. Like one thing, just to bookmark for now. I, there's nothing else really to say about it. Is okay. So what happens to this team when he leaves? <laughs> there, if yep. if we can we count on Eber? There's no uh, evidence as of right now that he can produce as well as he yeah, did certainly not. literally three years ago. And he has not had full time uh, training or experience with the team um, outside of this preseason, which is great. But we have no idea. And outside of that, we got nothing. And if we bring someone in, they wouldn't have had a, a preseason. They wouldn't have had time with the team. Uh, and these things take time to be a good striker, is to build that uh, that chemistry. So that's just a, 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 I hope, something the team has also prepared for uh, in the summer as well. Um, is there a world where Talish Magno is, like, where, where that's where the quality time from Talish comes? Like, sure. is there a world where, like, where where you start trying to accelerate him towards being like a number nine that can hold shit down? So that's if where you that's lose where his faith with Eber. That's where we go into the the conversation about transfers and stuff because we have left ourselves a little bit thin in a few positions as of now. Obviously, we could still get players. It's still a little early, um. So so we don't know what the reinforcement situation is going to look like, um. But there are a few positions where we're a little thin. One of them is on the wing, and one of them is uh, at left back. And so we kind of need Talish in a few places. Um, mm-hmm. At the wing, at forward, if Tati leaves, you know. So so that that's another thing. We've kind of left ourselves in a place where, uh, you know, 
w- those decisions need to be made, and then reinforcements need to be uh, brought in um, once that decision is made. So I don't know. I think Talish is like we'll talk about it, but he can. He's still a, a mold of clay, you know. He's he's an unmolded. Yeah, he's unmolded that. clay. I should say. Yeah, 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 yeah. Which we'll talk. I think I think all of that lands much more squarely in the. At, I'm here in the nerves, and I believe that they're on their way. But we'll get into them a little bit more next week. For now, let's keep on talking about these moves that didn't happen, as opposed to the moves that have not yet happened. Listen, when last you heard of us, we were very hot on this guy Polvar, and now not so much. You want to give us an update on um, how NYCFC fumbled the bag on a homegrown player? Yeah, it's still a story that is yet to be told in its entirety. We don't have NYCFC's take on it. Um, a lot of people will be like, oh, why are we spending so much time on a player who never came to the team? Blah, blah, blah. Um, and the reason we are is because this is a player who came through our homegrown system, who uh, we easily could have signed to a homegrown contract if we wanted to, uh, who was the number one player in college and who left to go overseas. And somewhere in the communication is like, uh, did you do enough to try to convince him to come? Um, because, like, I, I'm sorry, but this is a guy whose ceiling is so high and who who would have helped this team eventually. Um, and and we kind of had a free pass at it and didn't take it. And it got a little complicated when um, there's two things that are weird. One, his college coach said that NYCFC, you know, looked at him or tried to offer him when he was younger. And then after that, they never contacted him again, never wanted to sign him again, including this past offseason. That's weird also weird is that nycfc wrote an article and tweeted it out uh for their website uh about him being nominated for the herman trophy award best player in college soccer and then when he won it they didn't write an article and and just retweeted something else Uh, i found that weird i don't know it's like i think him winning the article is a little more important him winning the trophy is a little more important than him being nominated in my own opinion um but he was linked to Aberdeen the day of the trophy presentation and the day before. And then he moved and it was announced the day after he won the trophy. So um, there might have been mm-hmm. some sour grapes somewhere. I, I, this is something I will at some point try to ask someone about. What happened? Well, it, look, if, if you didn't want the player, that would be nice to know because that's a choice you're making. Um, and I think just, you know, we'll see how he does in Aberdeen. Um, going forward, he had to have surgery, but it's not. I don't think the team would have known about that either. Um, but you know, it's it's we're in a weird place right now where the U eighteen nineteen team is going to be dissolved and re fused into NYCFC two, which is going to be its own kind of monster. We'll learn more about and go more into, and it's and um, I don't know the the whole college pipeline thing is so weird that you know teams use it differently. Can we do a little segue on that? Let's sure. let's sidebar right now. What's That's all we got on Polvar. We're going very That's deep it. into yeah. it. Right? That's exactly. Not the new one Polvar, but like uh what but the NYCFC 2 thing, it's only just starting to shape up and we're going to keep you informed on it as we become informed on it. But what do we know about this change like to, for now? Well, for now uh, is that it's going to be a an independent competitive team that is loosely linked with MLS uh, that seems professional um, as in all the players get paid. Um, And it seems to be a, a a, a, almost a direct competition with the USL championship, even though USL is its own league, its own entity, it has its own pyramids. Um, It doesn't seem like it's directly a pyramid below a step below uh MLS, not every team is going to have a team in, in MLS Next Pro, um, which is the league we're talking about. But it mm-hmm. seems like a, a nice reserve league to have. It seemed like a, a kind of an obvious step to have since the just the communication between MLS and USL, uh, it just never seemed like it was going to work out. At some point in 30 years or whatever, maybe MLS will buy out that league or they'll share ownership and then it'll actually become relegation who knows but as of now like these players need reserve time um it's a league where you know david lee said in the introductory video of nycfc2 it's it's kind of for three things it's for um and i'm already forgetting what they were one of them was uh academy players who want to go straight into professional football um 
you know, drafted players or, or free agents we sign, young ones who we want to, who aren't ready for first team time or players who are on the first team but need some minutes and also players who are coming back from injury. I think that's one of the best ways to use it. That's how uh, baseball uses their minor league system is if you're injured and you need some uh, minutes to come back, like that's a great way to get some minutes too. So, so it's going to be kind of a hybrid between an academy, an older academy and, uh, the, a reserve team. Um, and, uh, it's kind of exciting. So we signed, uh, three homegrown players to kind of be the first players for NYCFC too. Hell yeah. Fucking a right. I mean, it's, it feels like a, a pipeline kind of thing that we've been waiting for in some form or fashion, the second team paradigm has always been something that like wasn't. Um, it, it certainly didn't seem like anybody's priority uh, at the beginning of this franchise's life, and personally, it was something that I was jealous of getting to watch, even like in the USL, these affiliated teams and their relationships to more established clubs. And it feels like this is a this is generating a little bit of a head of steam underneath it, which is going to be exciting to watch this season. Totally. Uh, um, yeah. And that's all we got to say about that. <laughs> sure. Bing, bang, boom. Um, let's go back to the big boys and the moves that did in fact happen, now that we've talked about the ones that did not. Uh, number one, big surprise, the second Chiagu to join NYCFC, Chiagu Martins, uh, DP signing. A shakeup. If only because how often does MLS like invest seriously in its defense? But this is a league-wide trend that we're seeing here. Martins is just one of several center backs who have been uh, on DP contracts, I think, that have been signed recently, if I remember my like Twitter scroll right. Um, talk to me about this signing. Is it dope? What is it shoring up for us? Where, what does it signal about the changing priorities of NYCFC? Uh, and how does it augment the team that we saw play last year? Well, there's three DP center backs right now of 58 DPs, I want to say. That sounds right. Um, f- m- m- that might be way off base. It might be like 48 or 38 DPs. Oh, my God. <laughs> Who knows? Um, <laughs> not a small percentage, I will say. It's probably 38, right? Um, <laughs> uh, so... I, but you're right. There have been more, and so you're like, why is there only three DP center backs if I feel like they've, people have been signing them? It's because you can sign them, and usually their contract is much lower than a DP Gonzalo Higuain kind of guy. So you can buy them down more easily with Garber Bucks um, and have their salaries not count as a DP contract. Um, uh, presumably, that's what this guy's going to be. We paid a $4 million transfer fee. It's from one team that's partially owned by CFG to another team that's uh, majority owned by CFG. So we're just moving money around <laughs> again. I wouldn't worry about the transfer fee right there. Um, but uh, as for signing a center back as DP, fine. I'm 100% okay <laughs> with it. We had two open okay. spaces. Two open spaces. One of them needs to be a impact, high value, high floor, uh, exciting, uh, goal score kind of person. I think we all agree with that. That's where you can get the most value out of a DP contract in this league. That's where uh, both on and off the field. And uh, if we leave, uh, if Tati leaves at some point, then it's going to have to be a priority. Um, the second one is fun. It's like, do we really need two exciting strikers when we have so many young talents that aren't on DP contracts? Like, I'm not sure. I don't think so. I think our biggest needs going into the offseason were uh, losing James Sands, which we didn't talk about, but that's okay. And, uh, you know, Rip. Uh, and also that... Uh, we'll talk about it. It's on the list. That that's that was one of the, the, the weakest, uh, least deep parts of this team was our center back pairing our center back pairing is the best in the league uh we can now say that uh uh with um you know with a star above our logo exactly above Um, our crest but uh i i it's it seems very weird that a lot of people are like oh yeah maxime he might retire soon and he's getting older and blah blah it's like i don't know (laughs) the maxime hasn't said that it seems kind of rude to talk about now he has been you know 
working on his coaching and getting his coaching licenses, sure. But, I don't know, he hasn't necessarily lost a step. He, it seems kind of rude to, like, uh, to like. oh, we signed this guy, so that guy's, uh, fuck him. Um, I'm sure, obviously, that he uh, he is getting older, and he does get beat up literally every game. So, uh, we can expect Maxime at some point to retire. Like, we can't keep those two guys on the field forever. Um but having like this depth piece that allows that's younger, by the way, like five years younger than Chano, um, in their prime, uh, who is part of the CFG family, so the CFG knows this player very well. Who right, right? Who so we had the and that also gives us like if other teams were looking at him, it gave gives us the 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 buy lane to to the 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 HOV lane to kind of you know jump in on that transfer if we wanted to, and we did, a- and. Uh, the depth at center back was the worst because Chanel always wants to play for Luxembourg. You know, bless his heart. Alex Callens is now a uh, rock solid starter for the Peruvian national team. Bless his heart for real. And we're gonna have times where we're gonna need a good center back in on the field because we suffer when we don't. We know we saw that so often. And God knows if there's ever an injury. Uh, I hope there won't be, but you have to be prepared for that. So uh, spending a DP on a center back here makes all the sense in the world to me. I'm okay with it. I, and a Brazilian. I'm more than okay with it. Yeah, absolutely. I think for all of the points that you made, I, the, the best is that like depth was a huge fucking concern in this position last year. And that like and that there was a kind of like... Um, it felt like when you're driving on a cliffside... With at, with at a part where there's no guardrail. Do you know what I mean? Where you're like, I know that I'm in control and nothing bad has happened yet, but if it does, I have nothing to stop it from going from, like, fucking uh, negative to total chaotic collapse. Uh, having this... Uh, the shoring, shoring up the defense, I think, is, a, <laughs> is just going to make it a more stable team. For all you can say about NYCFC 2021, it was not a stable team. Martins is a stable, a stabilizing signing in so many ways, and I think it's going to be really fun. Um, when, but we'll talk about the minutes that we've seen from him, the brief minutes that we saw from him this week uh, towards the end of the podcast when we recap, precap the CONCACAF champion stuff. Though you made allusion to it, um, it, sadly but unsurprisingly, James Sands has moved on from the NYCFC family. Uh, does this tell you anything else about like where further signing priorities might be, given how much duty James Sands was doing uh, in different uh, in different position? Like his flexibility and his intelligence on the ball had so much to do with what made this team solvent, and it feels really hard. Like you're not going to find a second James Sands. Ironically, he does have a brother, but but it's not the same. A twin obviously. brother. Yeah, <laughs> so in a sense, you can find a second James Sands, but you know nobody can replace what James Sands was doing for this team. What does that mean for this team's future, and where where else we're going to be looking as the season progresses? I think a lot of those decisions were already made in house uh, with both Kacha Acevedo and Gideon Zalalem signing extensions. Uh, Kacha signing mm-hmm. a very long one. Um, I think they're comfortable with how Tavon Gray played it, it, during the playoffs, that they're willing to just run him out there. Um, and at center back, we just signed a DP. So it seems like they feel like they have all their bases covered um, in terms of losing James Sands. It's more just sad, if anything. And it's like the flexibility. It's like what we don't have is like the most flexible players. Like you can't play Gideon Zalalem like in heavily defensive roles. You can't play Tavon Gray necessarily as a center back, even though he's played it before. And Thiago Martins can't play as an attacking player. So like we lose the flexibility that James Sands allows us, which leads to more subs having to be made, more roster spots being used, et cetera, et cetera. But um, in terms of actual on-field production, you know, it looks like they feel like they have a plan for dealing with losing James Sands. Um, so so I'm you know I'm okay with that. We didn't talk about Thiago as a player. You can just go a lot of this podcast is just going to be us telling you to go read stuff that people have already written. <laughs> um uh Paul wrote uh, of the outfield wrote for the outfield uh, a really good um uh write up on Thiago Martins as a player and what he brings. Um Essentially, he's really good, but he can't pass the ball for shit. It's really bad, and uh, that's something we're gonna have to live with. Um, and that's yeah, what you no, get. it's it's, it's just, it's, yeah. 
it, 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 does it make you worried for what the passing game at large in, in at NYCFC is going to be? That I mean, do you see a Gideon Delalem or a um, Nico Acevedo like? Like picking up the passing intelligence that we are losing in this team as time as time goes by and players level up to you know better and brighter pastures. I I think that oh, we'll it just talk feels about... like we're headed towards it. To me, what it signals, and I could be totally wrong about this, but it feels like we're heading towards a much more conservative NYCFC. That I don't know if it's going to be as fun to watch, or I worry that it won't be as fun to watch. Particularly if you don't, particularly once Tati leaves and you don't have somebody who is reliably. Who who's who's working as a target? Who's opening up space? Who can who who can surprise uh, opponents with pressure and build opportunities? If it is a sort of like chipping away by inches um, style of NYCFC play, I think that's going to be I don't know very interesting. I I wouldn't be too concerned because it looks like Ronnie's still sticking with the tactics, the game plan, uh, fitting players to the style as opposed to the opposite, and um, going from there. So the 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 foot is still on the pedal. Um, so it's all it's it's less about whether we have the players or the play style to be exciting and keep the pressure on. It's more about execution, and um, that's the concern. If there is a concern, I'm not concerned right now. Um, so we'll see. Great. Me neither. No, I'm not concerned either. I was just kidding. Is there concerned. any other? Is there any other signings you wish we could have made? Oh shit! I don't know. I think it would have been nice to to. I, I think it would have been nice to see somebody who feels like uh, even even to say like to add one more option right in because I'm boring and because I don't know anything. I just want to see strikers, and we have two players who feel like they can be developed or perhaps resuscitated. We pray into serviceable strikers, but it would be nice. Even I don't, I don't need a DP signing. I don't need someone who plugs the hole immediately or who's in immediate competition with Tati. But if you have, but nobody's a guarantee for like being able to hold down to lead the goal scoring on this, uh, on this team. But it'd be nice to get one more person who we can reasonably point to and say, well, that guy could be it too, right? So you have one of three, whether it's Eber, whether it's, uh, whether it's Talish, or whether it's some unknown quantity. Like, it would have signaled, uh, I don't know, like, <laughs> a readiness to deal with the gap that we're going to feel uh, by the end of the summer when, when Tati leaves. But that's about it for me. Sure, and, and I think that there's something to be said. A lot of people are saying, "Oh, we should sign a Divac or Rigi, or we should sign a fucking uh, yeah." Fucking. But that's silly, you know. So we should sign the, Lukaku. The it. But it's important to point out, like uh, Tati didn't come. Tati was not a, a blockbuster signing who came in and started scoring goals. He was developed here. <laughs> he was not at this yeah, good and when that's he started. Been- Exactly. No, I, I think that I, you know, a sign that I'm in my 30s is that I'm no longer begging for like a chance to I'm no, I'm no longer sitting here asking the team to give me opportunities to watch people whose best days are behind them play soccer uh, and like carry the team on uh, on their back because the team's the team and I are both mature enough to understand that true quality comes from within, <laughs> you know. So you didn't you didn't want a Lorenzo Insigne or no? Well, you know, I wouldn't say no. Yeah. But it's not priority. It's not priority. It's been, and this is what, you know, this is what Sims has said. This is what fucking Ronnie has said. It's just, and it's what won us the cup. It's not priority. It's priority. Mm -hmm. The best thing it can do is sell jerseys and raise attendance. And the, and beyond that, right? Like it's not, so if there's a, if it, if there's a moment where it seems like it's going to work, fantastic. But if we want to, I mean, I think the next cool thing would be for this team to fucking win it again. I th- and like for us to be a, a an obnoxious powerhouse, for us not to suffer the like blowback recession thing. I think that the f- like mindset, philosophy, culture of this team is really coming into its own, and I'd, I'm much more interested in just keeping the quality high than I am in um, anything flashy right now. I think that's going to be best for us. Yeah, and if you look at the dynasties in the MLS, uh, I mean, you can only point to Seattle. It's like, well, t- uh, they didn't make it. They signed, They got Rusnak from Salt Lake, sure. But outside of that, they didn't really do anything. They were like, we trust the guys we have on the field. They're good. Um, you know, we'll make one big signing to kind of plug in a gap where we might need it uh, if injuries come up. But uh, outside of that, we're good. And I think NYCFC did the same thing. Uh, I th- overall, I think it was a fine transfer window. You'll, there's more opportunities to find talent outside this league. 
during the summer than and before the World Cup than this window or next winter. So, um, all in all, you know, we still got the boys. We still got the boys. Uh, do you want to talk about the um, the draft pick signings? Sure. Who are they? <laughs> How did the I draft like, go? I really like the draft and the because I'm a big fan of like football and basketball and like I just love drafting. It means much, much, much less than MLS, um, but it's fun. It's exciting. Um, I, so I enjoyed the draft. I watched it. I followed on. It's really stupid. <laughs> it's so like you can tell how much MLS knows that the draft is going to be pointless very soon, especially with this MLS Next Pro thing going on. Um, that uh, eventually college kids are going to be like, oh, I'm just going to go sign for NYCFC two. Why am I going to wait to see if they draft me or whatever, etc. Insert team name there. Um, so the fact that like. The first part is, like, televised, but it was a live stream of essentially Andrew Wiebe doing a podcast with some people. And then uh, then you just have to watch the website, which was being updated, on like, f- only four times en masse and with, like, live. So you could see, like, where they would spell a name wrong, delete it, and write it again. It's great. <laughs> it, I had a lot of fun. And funnily, that's, that, funnily enough, funny enough, funnily enough? Funnily enough. Okay. It funnel, sounded funnel weird coming enough. out. Dump, um, the, dump the food in the funnel and I'll tell you when it's enough. We traded out of the first round to uh, the top of the second round. So our first draft pick found out by watching the, the website. Uh, and that was <laughs> that was Kevin O'Toole, who was a who is local, Montclair, New Jersey. And... Uh, hey. Red Bull Academy player. <laughs> hey! Um, Got him. And then uh, he, he said his first, uh, his first reaction when he got drafted was that he laughed. He's like, really? I went to NYCFC <laughs> of any team. I've worn Red Bull jersey my whole life, and <laughs> that's the team I get drafted by. Um, but he's super <laughs> happy, uh, obviously, to get drafted by the champs. Then our... Yeah, for sure. Yeah, he was. Uh, he's the Ivy. Uh, we'll t- I'll, I'll talk about that in a second. Our second pick was uh, in the third round. It was Kingsford Aj from um, Dayton, um, and then uh, Kevin O'Toole went to Princeton. By the way, he's actually still there. Uh, and our last pick was another local, uh, El Mahdi Yusufi from the New Nor- Northeastern Conference. Uh, Oh, I'm going to get killed if I say St. Francis. That's the school. Over in Brooklyn, across the bridge from Manhattan. Um, so I, I think it's really fun how NYCFC approached this draft. Obviously, it's not as important. You know, when, when you can sign Talish Magno for like 12 mil uh, out, of, out of South America, like who gives a fuck about the draft? But uh, it's a great way to solidify any lapsing holes. You can take big risks. Who gives a shit? And... Um, there's like roster benefits and, and obviously domestic benefits too. And then, um, we have NYCFC two coming. So like eventually like we'll need to fill that roster with a bunch of people and you might you know, want to stash some players there too. Um, as of right now, the, the status of all these players, um, Kingsford, who was our second of three picks, he got cut before we went down to, uh, Mexico, or he was cut while we were in Mexico. I'm not sure, but uh, around that time, um, and then so he's not going to be on the team. He he just signed to a USL League One team, and then uh, El Mahdi Yusufi and uh, Kevin O'Toole both um, made it all the way through the final training. But uh, I guess we're waiting to see if they get signed because they have not yet signed a contract. So we'll see if they do. Um, obviously the team likes them if they mm-hmm. kept them around all the way through the Mexican camp. Um, I like how they approach this draft because what we got, we got three, we drafted three like very attacking minded wing inside out, um, one-on-one dynamic, but like not finished products, not, not, uh, n- n- no real like significant like 
defined skill sets that are easy to plug in, but players that you're like, you know, they're good. Um, we'll, we'll just see how good they can become. Uh, they're, they're all big fish in small ponds. You had, um, the, uh, Ivy league player of the offensive player of the year. You had the, uh, a 10, one of the a 10s best players of first team, uh, all American there, and then uh, the second best player in the Northeastern Conference. Like these are three guys who were like the best players on the field almost every time they played. Um, I like that, uh, and and they don't come from like these legacy programs, um, which is where a lot of our academy players go. I I like that they um, are, we pick some smaller schools, mm-hmm. some like some like flashy kind of players who who show a lot on tape and, and have a, a really good work ethic. Um, so, so we have these two guys. Now we have Kevin O'Toole, who's a converted left back. He's a left footed right winger. Now, um, presumably like an Ismail to Shradi kind of plug in, although like has the defensive qualities up front that you might need small guy. Uh, but it, like his number one skill right now, is like one-on-one ability, just like he can get past defenders. Um, so we'll see if we stick him around as like a backup winger that we need. And then Almadi Yusufi is like the most. Also, we got older guys, mature guys. We didn't draft young. We drafted guys who like know they're, you know, who are mature. So uh, I, I'm, Yusufi's kind of like <laughs> watching him and his tape and hearing about him. He is like the, the, the pickup soccer legend. Like you see this guy walk onto your pickup field and then he plays and you're like, who the fuck is this guy? This is the best guy I've ever played with in my life. Just, like, has the ability. Like, you know, he'll, like, disappear, and then he'll come out of nowhere and score, like, a bicycle kick. It's He's been on Sports Center top 10, 10 at least once, I think maybe twice. He's just, like, you're just, like, where the fuck? He, he was a Moroccan youth program. Uh, Moroccan, he played for the Moroccan youth national team. And then he came over as part of one of those, you know, Africa to U.S. college scholarship programs um, for soccer. So... Uh, I I'm exce- he's almost like uh, so raw like a Talish Magno like uh, Chiagu like uh, we don't know what what this guy will be but we want to keep him around because he like <laughs> he'll score some bangers and like so I like it I'm good I'm good with mm-hmm, I, I mm-hmm. like drafting mature guys older guys who um, still have room to grow at the same time who fit where we need players kind of like on the bench we don't need starters out of the draft we need bench players. And who uh, seem like good guys, and are were big fish in small ponds, so um, they will compete. Yeah, absolutely. I feel like we've had great luck with the big fish in small pond um, mentality. Not in the sense that it's produced um, some like any any breakthrough stars, but that it has made for really serviceable dudes who understand that their job now is to compete on levels they haven't been allowed to before, and so put in solid performances when they're given the chance. Right, it's it's real second team shit in a way that um, that works, and I think is very validating to to like the broader system, which is dope. It's nice to have people to like. I think one of the most fun things about following MLS and following a, a, a specific side in MLS is is not so much the like protagonist narrative as it is the like churning underbelly of people looking for some kind of a breakout or even just like a professional life in soccer and that's what we're seeing these guys I, that, that's what I think is fun about those mature signings you get to meet someone like a real fucking journeyman player and watch them support your side yeah and, and not even to mention one guy we didn't draft who beat at, who uh, who signed an NYCFC 2 contract in Madison Beer we got a guy last name Beer yeah yeah uh, <laughs> Who I think came Break through our out. academy, if I'm not mistaken. But at the very least, he went to Georgetown with all the other boys we had there. Um, and I think he took a gap year. So he was out of soccer and life in general for a year. And then he came to camp and earned a spot. So we have beer. Uh, my favorite is we might get another Red Bull Academy player in Keenan Hot. So we might have hot beer hot starting. Hot beer. For the NYCFC two, uh, it's all exciting. I'm very. We'll cover gently, you know, when it all comes together in a month or so. Mm-hmm. The NYCFC two side, most definitely, you and I have to go and get shit faced at a game as just fans. That sounds so fun, dude. That sounds. It so does dope. sound fun, and I'm excited. Just go fucking crazy at NYCFC two matches. Definitely do it. 
we'll let you know so that you all can join in on our. Well, let's make the NYCFTC two official supporters uh, supporters club. The the third rail two or something better. The second rail. <laughs> the second rail. The second the second third rail. The sixth rail. Um, is there any? I don't think there's any other in or out moves that are worth noticing outside of um, my favorite thing. No one's talked about is that we kept all of our coaches who were trying. People yeah. were trying to poach from us. That's Hell my take. Yeah. Is like huge, hugely important. Probably the most important move we made this whole off season is keeping all the well, coaches. Well, and we we talked about it. We talked about it. A, a lot, yeah, like uh, the the value of the coaching staff. It's it's obviously where we credited most of the success of last season, and like and about the potential for those coaches to find moves that advance their careers. But I think it's also re- yeah, really telling that these guys are convinced that actually here is the best place to be, even in the like afterglow of that championship season. There's still more to do here. I feel like you can feel that. This is what I'm talking about. This is why I'm excited for this season. It's not a rebuild season. It's not a refractory period. Like shit is keep, shit keeps on going and building is happening. Yeah, if anything, a short off season helps that. Is like, yeah, uh, yep, yep. You keep the momentum. Uh, Ronnie was like, you know, none of the players fell out of shape because they didn't have time to. <laughs> they didn't have time. Yeah, there's only so much chilling you can do in like two weeks. Um, I want to talk about some in and outs, uh, the goals that went in and the dude that got red carded out of the match against nice. <laughs> Santos de Guapi. Thank you. Thank you very much. The CONCACAF Champions League is underway. Uh, a 2-0 first leg victory uh, is puts us in a real good position to advance to the next round. But I wonder if we could take 10 minutes to recap this match, talk about the next one, and assess whether or not NYCFC is going to win CONCACAF. Okay. <laughs> what do you think? Can what answer I that think? question, yes or no. Will we, win, will we win the Champions League this year? Do I? With my head or my heart? <laughs> uh, uh, oh, God, it's so... Are we, it's the, hard... <laughs> oh, my God. Just you say saw yes! The, sure, yes, sure. Yes, the answer is yes. We're going to the top, but okay. But why won't we? <laughs> it's just that the it's the closest a team ever came was like literally had to be the best team MLS has ever seen in that LAFC team, and uh, and frankly, we'll see if New England can do anything because they were the best in points last season too. But but this team NYCFC like they've gone through a playoff system and they've come out on top. The question is like balancing that. Can you keep a playoff mentality on and off? while you're playing a season. That's the hardest thing. I mean, that's what Champions League is, all this shit. Um, uh, Champions League. This is literally Champions League just in America. Uh, so it's hard to say. that The Mexican teams are just used to it, and they're good. So <laughs> you just have to beat good teams. Can we do that? Yeah, sure. But no one's ever done it before, so it's hard to say. Yeah, it's true. There feel, appears to be a special sauce that like we have not unlocked yet. But I, it's been said, and I think it's fair to say, that between, yeah, like, NYCFC and New England and, like, I mean, this is a really good slate of MLS teams playing in this league. It feels like we've got the best shot for an American team to win uh, to win the, the championship uh, that we've had in a long time, if only, like, on an odds level, right? The second and third level teams are also really excellent or proved a high quality of approach. And... Especially without with Tati still in, um, still in the roster, right? Like, I feel like we have a really solid shot at silverware here. We not we couldn't, a guarantee, obviously, but it's not nothing. We couldn't have asked for a better bracket either. Like, we got mm. the easiest le- on length that. of the bracket. Well, let me pull it up so I know what I'm talking about. Um, I don't think we we have to play a Mexican team next round if we win. Like, obviously, that was our peril last time, and we got pretty, cl- you know. Outside of, like, getting absolutely mauled in the second leg, we played pretty well the first leg last time, um, you know, the, d- the day that COVID came. Um, CC, uh, CONCACAF, <laughs> Champions League, <laughs> um, <laughs> bracket. <laughs> I watched uh, Colorado lose to um, a bad team. <laughs> That was fun. It's not like cool. It's hard cool, to say. Cool. It's not like there's any bad teams in this tournament, but obviously, like, 
the first round is the worst teams that are there, um, and they lost. So, uh, okay, I got it. La 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 la. la. Okay, so yeah, actually, I watched the Rapids game, Colorado, and they lost um, one nil um, away. So they could still definitely win if they just win two nil at home. Um, so we might face them next, and if we do, then then we'll have our first like real challenge in the semifinal, um, or it might be the quarterfinal. I don't know, guys. I just know we have an easy part of the bracket just off of glance, um, and. <laughs> So that's promising. It's promising that this is a team that uh, is seems in rhythm. We don't have to have a fucky schedule like we did during the uh, COVID year. Um, it the team just won the cup, so they don't have to be worry about like the pressures of like not being a champion yet. Like this is the next goal. Like their goal, obviously, yes, is to win another cup. But I think the idea of winning the cup last year was so at the front of their minds that if we had been in another competition that we needed to win, it wouldn't have, it, we wouldn't have been as successful now. Yes. They want to win another cup, but they've done it already. They know what it takes. So they don't have to fill that mental space with like all of this. They know like, Oh, we're in the champions league of America, whatever that means to them. They can invent this meaning that like, they know at least it's important and they can win. Um, anyways. So yeah. Uh, let's uh, let's talk about the team in the game, etc. <laughs> yeah, what were your big takeaways? I mean, like, well, can we go back to? We I feel like we've stuck so many pins in this game. We have to take a few of them out. Let's talk about Martin's first. I, in in his first minutes for NYCFC, what did you notice about his play? I didn't see anything. I don't think it's enough time to know. He's just getting his feet wet. It, it, it's good that I think the only positive you can take is that like he's. He's ready enough, good enough, healthy enough, and comfortable enough to get some minutes in, in an important game for this team uh, immediately. Uh, so that's good. And uh, and it doesn't seem like we will Yeah, be... that alone felt like a good a good sign to me. I was, like, exactly. Just, just the, the, quickness, the quickness of the turnaround felt like an investment of faith that I'm like psyched about. And the, that tells the idea... me that we're going to get a lot more opportunities to evaluate him very soon. Uh, and also using him as a third center back if we want to park the bus. Like, that's what we did. So that's an option available to us yet again. We don't have to, like, throw Tony Rocha into the midfield or, you know, all respect. Or uh, some other, or, you know, whatever. Or, like, drop Alfredo back or something like that. We can actually bring a center back off if we want to, um, to counter what they were doing. Um, uh, and, and much like Tiago getting some important minutes uh, that we didn't expect, so did Keaton Parks. Yep, yep, Absolutely. Very, very encouraging there. Um, it's, it's so huge, man. It means everything. Obviously, Keaton Parks is... I, I, is there's, there's so much chatter, specifically in NYCFC circles, about how um, Keaton Parks stacks up against everybody else in MLS and comes out, no pun intended, head and shoulders above them. Um, he's, it's, it's easy to forget how... I mean, we, we won the championship without Keaton Parks, and Keaton Parks is arguably our best player or most valuable player. That's a great point. Uh, so what the fuck is going to happen now, right? Like there is that this team won the league, uh, like hobbled. We, and so what? What does it look like when we're not? And can we hold on to that situation for this long? Did it feel good getting Keaton back in there? Yeah, he looked great. He's and, and especially not even being fit, and you could tell he really wanted to play. He was like, "I want to play. I'm I'm ready to go." Um, I, who knows? Like, I don't know with that kind of injury, like, what kind of... A, I, obviously, we have doctors who care about this stuff, but I don't know if there's any precautions he needs to take, if there's minutes restrictions, anything like that, or if it's just, like, get fit again. But uh, he is very good. Like Dark Souls, get good. He is so under... He's maybe the most underrated player in MLS. It's it, shocking to me. Yeah, yeah, I buy it. I definitely buy it. Um... um But formation-wise, how do you think... This is something that is kind of, like, slowly came to the assumption this is what would happen, uh, is that we'd stick to the same formation, but we'd have Talish Magno start with the losses of Izzy and Jesus Medina. We're in a new era, a Medina-less era now. And Mm -hmm. starting Talish Magno on the left and Santi Rodriguez on the right. What, what, What were you feeling about that? I felt like it was an experiment, and it was an interesting one, and it feel it felt um, well, it felt less uh, panicked. 
uh, primarily. And I feel like that was that's a that's an across the um, uh, like across the pitch uh, evaluation, right? That like th- it, it's also the same as getting um, getting Zalalem and Catch Acevedo in there. The whole thing felt, I think, a little bit more measured and less. This is what I'm saying. I I, I see a conservative tilt towards a team with a lot of talent. Um, or for, for a team with a lot of talent, which I think is potentially interesting, but potentially uh, is going to dry out certain certain matches, um, and and that's what this felt like to me. What about you? Yeah, I mean, it, it, I guess it's encouraging for you then if you think they're like trying to be more conservative. They still had uh, uh, four high quality attempts on target, uh, like in the first half. Um, yeah, absolutely. It's, so it looked they look comfortable at least um, because they still have. Tati talent. Castellanos, yes. yeah, yeah, because well, and, and, they, and they still have talent. Yes, yeah, exactly, exactly, exactly. You have, you still have playmakers. You still have visionaries. It's, it's, it's. I just fear for when those, for if slash when those visionaries like fall off. I think we should obviously without Santi Rodriguez, we'll talk about it. But uh, I think we'll expect more of the same in the next match. We'll see if Keaton's fully healthy and ready to go, because um, I think you want him on the field if he is. Um, obviously, we have two away goals, so all we have to do is just like not give up three goals and i think we'll be okay um which sounds okay and pretty easy the it went about as well as i thought it would be a lot of people say oh it was all messy and blah blah and yeah it was messy and yeah there's areas of concern like sean john didn't have the best game distributing out of the back um there was some panic dealing with uh kind of formationally what they were doing but a lot of it was clearly and obviously like just chemistry issues just uh rawness uh not enough time the beginning of the season like kacha and kacha and zalalem how many minutes do they have on the field together well you could see it's not a lot because they were their spacing was so weird especially in parts of that first half i found it really interesting like zalalem i was was tucking way under um melda's runs going up and i think like Try, I think that's something new. I don't know if it was... It seemed like it was on purpose. I think it's an interesting way to build up. Like, we don't have the attacking talent on the wings that we used to have uh, going up with Madarita and uh, Anton Tinnerholm. So I think you adjust by, like... You bring Zalalem underneath. You have the inverted wingers. Um, because Talish and Santi clearly are, like, much better, more centrally. Um, and you build the... So you build the overload that way if you can slide Zalalem around. Um, the question is, like, what does Kacha do in those situations? Do we have enough defensive cover if those things fall apart in transition? Um, you know, th- a lot of the answers to these things were no and not enough and not good enough in this game. But you see the foundations building of some really smart play. And and that idea of, like, keeping the, the DNA of the team from last year, the inverted wingers, the fullbacks going up, um, dropping one midfielder back and sending one forward, you know, all and Maxi doing what Maxi does is just like whatever he wants. Like, and, and Tati being a fucking savage. Like, all the things are still there, and that's why I was encouraged by like the win. It's fine. I think it was a good game. It it, it was ugly and and there was sloppiness, but to be expected. Right. Exactly. A two zero game that could have been a four zero game is really it's it's something that's the first competitive match that we've played out of pre or yeah out of out of the off season is incredibly fucking good news. I mean, we should be looking... I don't think we've ever... This is this is premature, obviously, but uh, frankly, we, we usually look like dog shit at the beginning of the season, and I don't think we've ever looked this um, competent uh, or solvent. And I think it's because we didn't make a lot of moves, <laughs> right? We yeah. lost some key players, but like we also, more importantly, didn't lose a lot of key players, a lot of even more key players, and uh, and things have not been shaken up significantly. Also, owing to what you said before, right? This, this was business as usual continued the form stayed and the coaching staff at the center of it like as holding on to this team is still this team which is a delight that just doesn't actually happen that often that you get to like come back to the same team fundamentally you left off on and watch how they evolve live and i feel like we're gonna get to do that um i have a question for you here's what it is (laughs) he framed (laughs) terribly um do you give a shit and I've already asked you if you think we'll win, and you said yes, and I'm holding you to it. But do you think we do or should give a shit about winning? Is this what is is priority? This the trap that any uh, MLS team falls into because of our schedule uh, when we play in Concacaf Champions League is 
is is a misallocation of energy that leads to a a, a hole you can't dig yourself out of in the regular season play, uh, and and kind of a sh- and often a shot season. I mean, we saw it happen with that fabulous Toronto team a few seasons ago. Um, is there a cautionary tale there for NYCFC, particularly when we're talking about like remaining lacks of depth? You know, I was looking at our schedule, and the, the, there's only one concern I have. I think, yeah, you can say we have lack of depth in places, but I think for a lot of these MLS games, like if we're playing on, if we have to decide between like playing a healthy starting eleven, full power starting eleven on the road, or like committing to a Concacaf Champions League game. Um, with the starting eleven and starting some backups, like okay, you can, you can start some, like, why do we have Jason and Hack on the team if you're not going to give them some opportunities too? Like, like we didn't have to use them last year, and that's great, but they're there because we might have to use them, and so that's these are the opportunities. And our schedule, as of now, is super friendly. It's one of our easier schedules we've ever had, frankly, and I'm thankful for that. Now, with the baseball situation all fucked up, MLB lockout, that that really could fuck us up. And I know the team's already talking about it. They're already, like, strategizing about what they might have to do. You would hope so, but but that's not breaking news. They're like, oh, we should have um, a conversation about this. But uh, they have been for a while, I guess is what I should say. It's like the, the, the... it right. Feels well, co- more- contingency plans have been required so many times in the past. This is just another. This is just another link in the chain. You know. There's yeah. Well, to some do. of some of them have yeah. been bad, like Hartford, Connecticut. So, hope, yeah. hoping we have some better ones. Um. So yeah. Uh, uh, I think if all things, if we can like not mess up the schedule too much, and not move games around too much, and not move locations around too much, like then we should expect we should be okay. But having having an MLS next pro. Which, by the way, is being coached by our former academy coach. Seems like the most sense of a sensible hire of a coach for that team. Um, th- then I think we'll be in a, in an okay place for dealing with congestion. We dealt with it well last year <laughs> by the skin of our teeth. I think we can deal with it a little more prepared this year. I think so uh, too, San- or at least I'm counting on it. What do you say? Santi Rodriguez, red card. Uh, oh, it was yeah, bullshit. Goofy shit. Absolutely. Shouldn't have been a red card. And annoyingly, right, like costs us him the the next leg. But that just means that we're going to have to, I think, I think it's going to be a more, perhaps a more cautious uh, round of, I mean, like we're going to park the bus for 90 minutes, right? That's the only thing that that could possibly mean when we're going into it with a two-year lead. Uh, Is this, has this team ever done that? No, but like, why the fuck wouldn't you? I mean, I don't want to watch it. But like, what's the upside to doing anything else? Yeah, just bomb it over the top. I, I'm curious to see what he does because in, in in this match, Ronnie played the hits. You know, yeah. tactically, is is that going to change? I I just think you play, you can play a little more loose and counterattacking soccer if you do put in uh, Chiagu uh, up top. We'll call the other guy Martins, shall we? Um, editorial decision. Um, but if we put Thiago up top on the wing, we didn't see him in the last game. But if we put him up top, the captain of the B team, which I thought was funny when we played our B team uh, in a preseason game, he was the captain. That's cute. Uh, I, I think that lends itself more to like, yeah, bombed over the top. Let him, let him run it out, um, which would work against a team that is going to be chasing goals while trying to play three at the back. So. Um, cool. Yeah, I'm. I, I think we'll be okay. My problem with is just like, I don't know how much we're gonna have to depend on Kacha, but we're gonna have to decide whether or not we will depend on him because he needs game time. Like the only time Kacha has looked okay in this team, like he has a lot of room to go. He has the promise. He has one of the high ceilings uh, on our team, but he has not shown it. He also has one of the lowest floors because. When he doesn't get game time, he plays nervous. He has no idea how to turn when he has the ball, when he gets the ball in the midfield, uh, which is a huge skill you need if you're playing like the six or a double pivot. Um, and uh, he he lacks like any kind of situational awareness with other players around him. Like 
he has looked good on our team, but only after getting consistent starting minutes. So I think they need to make a decision sooner than later. And whether they want him or Alfredo is like the, the guy in the midfield. Yeah, that yeah, I don't know. That's I can't wait to see how it goes in the next round. I, I, it feels like it just all feels like it's written in draft right now. You know what I mean? It's it still feels like preseason, even though it's matches with consequence. Oh, one hundred percent. I don't think that that's gonna change until until opening day. Is there anything else we want to cover here? I mean, we can tease what's did going you, on next time. What did you did you want to talk about? The, oh, you want to take a, a minute to talk about your dying love for the your undying love for the kit. The new kit. Oh hell yeah, absolutely! Y'all are fucking. I mean, you can you you'll you'll hear about it. It it rules. The new kit with the. I mean, there's lots of reasons to like it. I found some. I don't remember who it was. Some Tim Plato's guy was like, uh, "Bless you, you know, if you're a listener. Thanks for thanks for checking in." Uh, was tweeting about how like it goes beyond aesthetic because the bolt is for the third rail and the orange is for Templados and it's a gesture to the supporters groups and like okay yeah but also the aesthetic rules <laughs> it's good it's a good design people out here like blah blah like trying to say like at the hypno kit was a better a I better hated second that kit or third so jersey much. and I kind of liked the hypno kit but I kind of had to talk myself into it this one is just cool. It slaps. I never liked the sky blue. Have never liked the sky blue. That was always a tax to supporting this team, not a perk, right? Um, don't like to be meant like uh, reminded of CFG every time I sit down, or like wa- look at a player, or like see any glimpse of anything. This kid is. Uh, this kid feels like New York, man. It fucking rules. It's cool as hell. It is the Bowie kit. It's, it is the the Professor X kit, and I want it, and I'll take it. Uh, on the other hand, I also think the dude wipes shoulder gotta go. <laughs> we might need I, to save that for the next time, but yeah, because we'll get I have more we'll, than we'll enough talk words on that for sure. Hey, we, we want to get into the barstool sports paradigm. Let's fucking throw down on this. Let's get. Let's talk about. Let's talk about dudes needing special wipes for their buttholes. For dude, dude buttholes are uh, important, precious objects to be preserved um, and guarded from any feminine uh products or anything babyish but you or know any what? neutral products yeah anything neutral at all it's so dumb y'all it's so fucking we'll talk stupid. about it with um, uh, and that was on the and it's such a prominent oh my god and just like the name dude wipes it's like fucking it's 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 as if they and don't not to court controversy but it's as if it was like coinbase or like fucking or like an nft like if they put an nft on the jersey it's that annoying it's a it's it, it a, just seems it, it seems the most annoying coming off of so uh soul de cacao like oh bronx yeah. uh black owned business like uh who ha- who has zero money to get any kind of sponsorship anywhere like we're gonna give them that space and it's like yeah dude wife will take your money <laughs> it's just gotta um, you know it's 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 one for one next year also we'll get... don't buy them they they are not flushable they say they're flushable they're not don't buy yeah them. don't you can buy them but don't flush them you just have to leave your poopy wet wipe in the fucking trash can you disgusting pervert next year we'll get like a, a silhouette of sonia stupid. sotomayor or something instead like it's one for one <laughs> year in year out yeah we have to alternate trey where do you tweet uh, at uh um, no, you don't want to wrap up 